As I spent time with the Lord over the last few weeks, I was asking him, what do you want to bring to your people? Lord, if I'm bringing a topic, what is this topic? What word do you have for your, your children? And I heard him say boldly to me, hope. I want you to bring hope. I heard his leading for this church to find hope and trust in him. Even in my own life, I have found how desperate I was for hope. For me, it's been a year of looking for hope in different situations. To have hope for the outpouring of God's spirit within this church and revival within our nation. I'm looking to the prophetic words that have been spoken over our nation, over this church. I'm longing, I have hope for those things to have hope for physical healings and miracles to take place even within this church body. You guys are always heavy on my heart, and I can say that for all of our staff here. I have had hope for a healed and restored relationship with my own family, with my parents, with different things going on in my own life. My, my soul has been crying out in this year over very heavy, big topics. And as the Lord highlighted that need for hope for me, I found how dry I was in my spirit. I was dry because I was looking past that hope and I was looking at the situations around me. See, Jeremiah 29, 11, I find such comfort in this verse. It says, for I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. This is a sweet, sweet verse. Does the Lord lie? Does his word return to us void? No. So in all that I'm going to cover today, I want you to return back to that verse. No matter what is going on in your life, look at it and think, the Lord, he places his thoughts towards me. His thoughts are of peace and never of evil. How many times have we heard people say in their depression or in their down times, the Lord doesn't care about me. He's turned his back on me. It's not what his word says. It's never for evil. It's to give you a future end a what? Hope. That is a promise. That is his heart. It's for his children to give hope. A father or a mother does not look to give evil to their children, but hope for their future to become better than they are. Somehow I allowed the enemy to steal and remove this very scripture from my heart, or maybe it was just my flesh is weak, as all of us have weak flesh, and maybe I just plainly forgot. Even in my studies, you can overlook and overread things, but his words are true. This topic of hope, I just want to saturate for today. But I really want to be looking at Romans 5, 1 through 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm going to read through this scripture. We're going to put it on pause and we'll return to it in the end. But I found it so fitting for this topic and with the word that the Lord has for you that I'm going to give, it's very fitting. With everything going on in people's lives right now, it's very fitting. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, having been justified by, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in what? Hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. What did he just say? Are we really supposed to glory in tribulations? Here's the reason. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. This is something trained into you. It's something that is given to you when you... Jeremiah, my brother. Hope now does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Lord God, I just give this time to you. 
Lord, I ask in this time for ev what everyone has been going through, the, the hope of our future, Lord, I ask that you would pour that out. Speak to us this morning. Amen. See, as God has been guiding me through hope and trust in him, I've discovered how much faster I can bounce back. It's, a, it's something I believe is learned. And I just say that out of my own experience. The more that I, I learn about hope, the more I put trust in him, it's easier. My, my desperate times are more quickly come out of. I find healing and correction in him rather than relying on my own strength. You see, hope is both a gift and an action. It is something to be recognized, chosen, and used. Not just sitting there waiting, which it is a gift, but we have to recognize it. It's something that comes through tribulation. When we understand what hope is and practice implementing into our lives, it becomes natural. This becomes who you are to where you're not taken down so quickly and you bounce back that much faster because it's a natural part of who you are. The Lord loves this church. As I spent time with them, I felt the leading of the Lord to share this with you. The Lord has said over you, my people have traded hope for despair and peace for fear. I long to restore the gift of hope into this generation. I long to pour out my heart onto all generations. There is worry about today and fear for tomorrow. There is fear over this election and strife within families. My word for this time is hope. There is no anger in my voice, frustration in my heart. Does a father get mad at his children for lack of understanding or foresight? Does a mother get frustrated with her baby as it cries for milk, even when it has lost hope that it will not receive some in a timely manner? No, my love endures all things and time. I pour out my love as a reminder to hold to hope as a young child holds onto her doll. I am releasing a greater measure of hope in this congregation. There will be a steadiness and security that surpasses your understanding. Others will look to you in disbelief of your strength and hope you have for tomorrow. I declare that in this time, you will be the Peter that stepped out of the boat and walked on the water, not the Peter that lost hope and sank. Turn your head to me and in expectation for your longing hearts to be satisfied. The blood of Christ pumps through the veins of this church and she shall not weaken. I desire to release an understanding of hope to be a mindset and a tool. This hope is a newfound reality that will not dissipate. You shall walk with steadfast trust in Jesus, knowing that it is through hope for tomorrow that you find rest and knowing that I work all things for good for those who love me. So set your heart towards me and do not shy away. With this hope comes trust, and without that trust, you cannot stand in hope. Trust, be still, and know that I am your God. The Lord does not want despair to rule over anyone's life. See, that spirit of despair and torment not only affects your life, but the lives of those around you. It changes you. It distracts you. When I despair, it affects Rachel's life, my kid's life. It affects how I minister here if I allow the spirit of despair or torment to rule over my mind. Torment is distracting. It steals your heart and your mind from the here and the now. It robs you of your future. It adds those little premature gray hairs, which I know I have gained a few more this year, and I know it's not from age. I believe that despair and torment is attacking many within this church body. And the Lord desires to lift us up to a place that he is waiting for us, and that is on his rock and firm foundation. But how do we recognize and fight torment? Torment is a weapon against hope. I've always believed that we should know and recognize our enemies, the principalities and powers that we fight, as well as those within our own flesh, our human nature. And torment is one of those who operates as a principality and power, as well as a condition of our heart and our sin nature. Torment battles hope. 
Torment is very debilitating. It's a destructive weapon of the enemy, even a weapon of our own human nature. We see it in the world around us. You get on the news and there's torment and suffering and distraction to the hope for what the future has. See, torment is defined as a great physical pain or mental anguish, a source of harassment, annoyance, or pain. See, that definition even has it broke down to where it's something a part of your mind, your flesh, as well as something that is harassing you or annoying you or causing pain. It's a principality as well as an act of the flesh. According to Strong's Concordance, torment means suffer. This means that when we engage in thought patterns or language or beliefs of things without hope, we are in the state of being of suffering. This is the torment that plagues many of us, and I believe as I watch this next generation come into this world, that plagues them. As I look to our high schoolers in that young generation, I see torment. But today it ends. For it is the job of the church to stand up and declare the hope of the living God. It is the job of the church to stand up and say, enough is enough. It is time that torment is done. It is time that hope of the living word reigns and lives and breathes within the hearts of our young people. It is time for us to stand as one body in one church and say, today is the time for hope. Hope is the confidence and the trust of things unseen. And even when this younger generation or we ourselves cannot see what is going to take place, we cannot allow that torment to rob us of that future that could take place. It is only through trust in the glory of God that we have hope. That is truth. Hope means to have confidence and trust, to desire and consider anything possible. No matter what it is, hope is that. It is an expectation. Hope is trust in the Lord God Almighty. Through my studies and as I have pressed into the Lord for his teaching about hope in my life, I've learned that I must first trust him. Trust his plans, trust his actions. I am embarrassed to even say this as a mature believer that too often if I am brought down by the enemy or brought down by my being stuck in my own thoughts, that the Lord has to remind me, trust in me. I don't know how many times I'm worried about relationships with my family or with other people or losses within our church body or whatever it might be through work or ministry. How come as a mature believer I have to be reminded But I'm still a child of God? I'm still going to have to work through that process of remembering that there is hope in him. Amen. It's a basic concept that I should not forget that is a part of my human nature to forget. Trust in the Lord is the road leading away from torment into hope. It is by trust that you're even able to hope. You cannot hope without having trust in the Lord. Not long ago, I was driving around lost in my own thoughts, as some of you may do, I know I do, I hear the Lord speak to me, though I'm not going to dive into all that he shared, but it was a long drive and he had a lot to say. But he prophesied over my life and my children's life and what I was to expect to come. But part of what he said as I was stewing in a place that I probably shouldn't have been in my own mind, he said, son, you work and you worry about your heart and I will worry and work on their heart. He went on to coach me and give me hope for my future, but it's that word that has stood out to me. As basic as even that is, we should all know that. He was calling me to work on my relationship with him. He was calling me to work on my own righteousness and to cling to his righteousness. He was calling me to to listen with my ears the correction of a father to a child to say, no, no boy, you don't, you don't do that. 
or the encouragement as he coaxes me along. See, he was telling me to seek healing and correction from him and not worry about other people or other situations or events that were outside of my control. I'm not looking to have warrior thought over those things. Again, it's just so basic, but so true. How can something so strong and abrupt snap you back into reality? You see, that is true reality. And that true reality is where the Father lives and operates. That reality functions with hope and trust with Him. You see, oftentimes we get stuck in our own thoughts. We get stuck in the news. We get stuck in the world. That's not true reality. But true reality is in hope and trust in Him. It is there that the Father lives. It's there where the Father is saying, come child, come to me. It's in that place of reality that we are called to mature into. It is in the Father's reality that hope is a substance. It becomes a real thing. It's the air that you breathe. It's the food that you eat. It's the water that you drink. Jesus says, I, do not, I am not hungry. I have food that you don't know about. He had hope for the future of the people that he was about to talk to. He was being fed by that hope, sustained by the hope. There was no worry. Nothing could touch him. There was no fear for tomorrow because he had hope. Hope in the glory of God expels all suffering, all torment, all fear, and all worry. That's just what the word says. It is a biblical understanding of hope that we find a roadmap on how we're to maneuver through life. Biblical hope is a confident expectation and firm assurance regarding things that are unclear and unknown. It is based on the promises of God and is anchored in faith. Do I say it again? It's that confident hope, that confident expectation, the firm assurance regarding things that we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but we can trust that he has it. We can trust that he is in control. It's the, it's the promise of God and and when we are anchored in our own faith, we trust that promise that he has. That is biblical hope. But is it always easy to find hope? Is it always easy to stand on hope or remain in that place of hope? No. It can take work. We have to labor for hope. Romans 5. See, when you're not already standing in that place of hope, maybe you have gone through this life and you just, the physical world around you, you have never had hope. You were born into, you were raised in a place that there was no trust. There was no hope. You had no trust in your family, no hope in your family. Your job, you're, you're bouncing from one thing to the next. There was no hope for your tomorrow. Sometimes we are given a lot that doesn't have that hope. But the beautiful thing is that the word of God is sitting there saying, I have the answer. And that answer is Jesus. He is our hope. It is in him that we can find that hope, that we can learn how to have that, that base, that platform to stand on. That is hope. You have to labor for it. It's a learned skill. But we always have to remember, and I've shared this before, the Lord calls us to search Solomon says in Proverbs 25, one of my favorite verses, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. It is our job to search out things, to search out the heart of God because of what Christ did for us. We are the king in that scripture. It is our job to search out matter. As a king, you are called to do this. What he's saying is, don't grow stagnant, is really what that's saying. As a king, do not just sit there like a lump on a log. But what is matter? What, what are we supposed to search for? Before, as I was going through this, I had a few pages of, of matter that I want to break through. But for the sake of time, I shortened that down. So listen close. 
I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but I'll say the glory of a king is to seek the understanding of God's will, to study his word, to receive the Holy Spirit and align with God's principles. That is matter. We are heirs with Christ and called to rule and reign, period. God's kingdom is why scripture calls us to seek after God's spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and the spirit of God, the Ruach HaKadosh. That is the matter. We are called to seek after him. We're called to seek after his spirit, and his spirit are the seven spirits of God. We're called to search out many things, but today the Lord is calling us to search out hope and trust. He's calling us to trust in him, even when we see just darkness in front of us, despair in front of us. He's calling us to trust in him. But it's up to you and how you respond today. It's up to you whether you want to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to search those things out, or no, I'm going to remain here. It's your choice. It's not my choice. It's your choice. It is not my desire to just stand up here and share my own testimony, but it's my desire to pull you guys along with me in my own studies. I also don't want to be the hypocrite today. I too am still learning as I mature, as we all mature, and what it looks like to have hope. In the lowest of lows, what it looks like to have hope. We are all learning that, and I believe we will all continue to learn that until we go home. I want us to learn as one body, as one church, what it looks like to be able to be clothed with hope and trust and to be delivered of the spirit of torment. It's my my desire to always stand firm, unmovable, and unchangeable by the strife of this life because I am firmly rooted in hope, but it's a learned skill and it takes practice. What better way than to practice as a group, to practice as a church, to as one body using the word that God has given us to move forward in hope, laying that foundation for the generation that's supposed to follow us of this is what it looks like to be unmoved by the things of this world for us to raise this next generation and say, this is what it looks like to be unhindered by who is in the White House. This is what it looks like to be unhindered by deaths in a church body. This is what it looks like to be unhindered by things that come against us. This is what a firm foundation looks like, children. It's our job to say that and to prove that and to show that. That's our job, our task. And so as I have And walking through this, I encourage you to walk with me. What's it look like to have hope, that firm foundation in your life? Now, I recognize that hope is a topic that is preached on a lot. Pastor Corey has touched on it. I think I've touched on it years ago as we did our cleansing streams Wednesday nights. But I have to say, it is hope that the Lord told me to bring here today. It's not my job to say, I know, Lord, I've done that before. He said it. I brought it. It's hope that we often misplace in our human nature. It is hope that transforms our life. It's hope that revives true and real trust with God. How many times are we stagnant in our weekly readings, our morning readings? Whenever you're in the Word of God, is it stagnant? Is that because you've been robbed of hope and you don't have, you're sitting there, what's the point? Maybe you need to have that revelation of trust, that real true trust in God. So let's start by looking at that biblical concept of hope. See, it's more than just wishful thinking or optimism, and that's what the world defines hope as, is I wish this will take place. I wish this would happen. Oh, please, will you give this to me? That's the world's definition. But the the Bible As I read earlier, it's the confident expectation and assurance in God's promises. If it's in his word, it is true. It is rooted in faith and trust in God, his character, his faithfulness to fulfill what he has promised. It's not your job to fulfill what God has promised. It's God's job to fulfill what's promised. Too often we put on our shoulders, well, God says this, so I have to do it. Well, maybe it's not his timing and it's not your job in the first place. 
It's his promise. Let him do it. See, when I was looking at the, the word on hope, and it is from beginning to end, hope. It's in the entire book. But I found there was a difference between the Old Testament hope and the New Testament hope. Not a big difference. It's still hope. It's still biblical hope that I just read the definition to you. But there was something slight in there. I want to look at those. Real quick, the Old Testament examples. You have Psalm 39, 7. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Micah 7, 7. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. What do we read here? We see it said over and over again as I went through all these, I had plenty to give you. But it was, Lord, I wait. Lord, I expect. Lord, I watch. In the Old Testament, hope conveys a sense of waiting expectantly for God to act. But as we read into the New Testament, something happens. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see those words being used there? Fill you with joy, abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, it was Jesus that was added. He changed it for the waiting expectantly, or Lord, I am watching. I know you will do it because you always do it to it being fact. Lord, I have joy because you will do this thing. You are doing this thing. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit so that he burns inside of us with the power of that hope. It's abundant. It's already given. The beginning of time and the end of time all started on the cross. In our Greek thinking, I've said it before, but we think Adam and Eve, and over here you have Revelation, and it's a straight line right over there. The beginning and end of time happen on the cross, and it goes around. And there is hope right there. Jesus gives us that hope. He makes it real. He makes it for the now. It's not just a waiting, but it is a now. Jesus added the confident in the confident hope. He added the confident expectation it went from waiting expectation in the Old Testament to confident expectation in the New Testament. This hope is often associated with the promises of God through the Holy Spirit by Jesus. It is through the Holy Spirit that we have that hope, that we have the power. And praise God for that. Hallelujah. He set it up this way on purpose. Because of Jesus and what he went through and because he breathed the Holy Spirit onto us, because we are endowed with the power, we are baptized and made new, we go straight into expectantly waiting and confident expectation, confident hope. But knowing this is different than implementing it into our lives. How do we implement this? Like I said earlier, what if you just don't know that hope? What if you've never experienced it or you've never learned what that means in the first place? It was never the culture around you. Well, I'm glad you came. I have four points, points, topics, key themes that I want to help us break down on how we can implement this into our life. That first one is the word I keep saying, and that's confident expectation. Confident expectation is knowing that God will fulfill his promises. You think it's maybe or sort of, kind of will? It's know that he will completely, fully do it 100%. This is rooted in God's unchanging character and faithfulness. Does God change? Is he the same yesterday, today, and kind of tomorrow? No. He is not changing. But do we? Are we fickle? We are. But you know, we can find this confidence 
because it's rooted in Jesus Christ. It's easy to find that confidence as a child of God just by looking at Jesus. Paul says in Romans 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then what? Heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Paul continues, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But what if we hope for what we do not see? We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. I love Romans 8. It's one that's a staple for me. Whenever I lack confidence, I go to Romans 8 because I know it promises, it says that I am a co-heir with Christ. He is my elder brother. He is my savior. And it's through him that I have hope. It's through him that I have true confidence, expectation. And we're eagerly <clears throat> waiting in perseverance. I think this is huge within our younger generation. They're running around. They don't know who they are. I also see it in our older generation. You're entering into that retirement age. Your identity has been your job for all these years. And you step out and, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know who I am. I don't know what my gifting is. Well, you have confidence in Christ because... You are a co-heir with that Christ. And you can step right into doing his work, his ministry. Your identity is in him. He is the one that gives us purpose. Number two, faith and trust. This one seems simple because we hear it all the time. Have faith, trust in him. Hope in the Bible is closely linked to faith. You cannot have hope without that faith. You can't have hope without that trust. It involves trusting in God's promises, his plans, even when circumstances are difficult or outcomes are unseen. See, the manifestation of the Spirit is unto the Lord who wills it. That means our job is to sit there waiting, expecting, and knowing that God will show up because it's his will for us to prosper in our future. We have to have trust in him, trust in his word. Colossians 1, 5 says, because of hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. It says it all right there. We have trust in this true book, this gospel that has been given to us. We have hope for tomorrow, hope laid up in heaven. Our hope is in Jesus according to that scripture. Blessed is the one who does not see yet believes and blesses the man that trusts in the Lord. We are those who are blessed because our hope is in Jesus and we haven't seen him, but we will see him. Galatians 5.5, 5, for we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Again, beautiful scripture. We are called to have faith and trust in God who gives us steadfast hope. And we will enter through that veil into his presence. And we have to have faith that we will do so. And this might be difficult to some. So if you're in that place, like, yeah, good words, Ryan, but faith is hard. I don't understand faith. Then to cry out to your Lord and ask him for faith. That is something that he gives you, that he pours out for you. If you but ask, he will give you that without measure. He won't delay giving you faith. Praise God and amen to that. Number three, future orientation. What's our future look like? Well, we know because we've read the end pages. We know what's going to happen. Biblical hope often pertains to future events, particularly the fulfillment of God's promises and the ultimate redemption and restoration brought by Christ. Psalm 33, 18 through 22, I feel says this best. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him 
one of the spirits of the Lord, fear of the Lord. On those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trust in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. Our hope for our future is in him and that will never change. He will always be there. No matter what you're going through, your future is in him. You may doubt. You may have the enemy speaking lies into your ears. You may have weakness of your flesh, of your human nature, but just know that your future is secure when you remain in hope in Jesus. It is his love that sustains us. Even in the deepest, deepest of valleys, he is there. Even if death surrounds us, he is there. We have hope in him for our future and the eternal life to come. No matter what, you have him for eternity. Praise God for that. And number four is our current tribulations. And this is where I really want to remain. This is where the Lord, I feel like, was really calling me into, is in the tribulations of what everyone is going through. He has the answer. He's calling us into a, a, a way forward. He has the door open for us. See, at the beginning of the service, I read Romans 5, and I said we're going to return to that, so I'm going to do that in this section. See, Paul explains what tribulations produce in our lives when we keep our hearts open to the Holy Spirit. We are called, as long as we have our, our doors open in our heart to him, he will be able to work. But as soon as you let that heart turn to stone, he can no longer function in your life and do the work that is needed to cause hope for your future. If you feel stagnant, if you feel like you're desperate and don't have a way, maybe check your heart to make sure it's not stone first. Because that is a guide from the tribulations in life. Did I turn into what Paul said or did I turn to my heart of stone? And this right here is that, that tipping point is where I'm asking you, which direction did you go? Which way did you choose? How did you choose to respond? So what are we supposed to do in those tribulations? I mean, do you choose that heart of stone? Do you wither? Do you fade away? Do you rebel? grow angry, complain, backbite about others around you. It's their fault. It's his fault. It's not my fault. That's a stony heart. In the tribulation, you turn to anger. You act out. You rebel. You run from the church. You run from your family. You, you yell at your family. and You do something different. That is a stony heart. That is not a heart full of hope, but that it's a heart in rebellion to the Lord. So I'm calling you to be careful. Be careful that you do not fall into that trap of a stony heart. Be careful that you don't, that you don't give way to something that will block the move forward for you. No, we are called into perseverance, then into mature character, and finally into hope. You know, in reading this, I see it as something that's like a hamster on a wheel. It goes around and around. It's not just an, as, as I am a 10-year-old and I accept Jesus into my heart, I'm at, I'm at A, and then I go through tribulations, I have perseverance, and I'm, I'm mature in character, and then I have hope over here when I'm 80. I don't think so. And I could be wrong, but what I see in all of our lives is even if I'm here, I'm that 10-year-old, I see the tribulation and the perseverance and the mature character and the hope. It goes around and around. But the problem is when you stop that hamster. When you refuse to move forward in those things of the perseverance and the mature character and the hope, then you just die. Your heart turns to stone. And so we have to take this to heart to recognize that this is something that continually goes to never give up. You might feel like, yeah, I've, I've done that and I'm, I'm wearing out. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, I tried that. I, I, I matured, but I left the church because I just couldn't handle it anymore. Tough. Sorry, tough. What Paul is saying is that you have to continually work your way through that. That maturing process never ends. 
that perseverance. I'm sorry, but we live in a sinful, fallen, ugly world. And our job is still to continue in that growth. And when we continue, I promise you, and what it says here is you find that hope. Amen. When we lack hope, we lack maturity, plain and simple. When we lack hope, we lack maturity. I want to read that scripture again, Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith in this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope in the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out on the hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given us. Truly, I could preach just on that verse 5. Hope does not disappoint. It's beautiful. I, I read it to Rachel yesterday, and she said, that's it. It is. Hope does not disappoint. You could be going through the worst, yuckiest, awful thing. Hope does not disappoint. Remember that. See, when I look at this scripture, it makes me think of David. David is a true example in this. He had that maturity. We saw him fall. We saw him cry out to the Lord. Every one of his psalms follows this p pattern. He has tribulation. And in that, he cries out to the Lord, giving him perseverance. And as he's crying out to the Lord, he begins to declare. And in that declaration, that's called mature character. And in that mature character, as he's declaring, he is using hope to look through this spyglass into the future to receive what he's declaring out. And that is the final hope part of this verse. David lived out what Paul is talking about here. If you take that model, you write it out, and you look at every psalm that the psalmist wrote out, it goes in that pattern. Every time, despair, perseverance in that, crying out for the Lord, declaration, a true mature believer declares if you're not declaring in your prayer time, then I petition for you to look at David and recognize what does it mean to declare in my prayer life? That's maturity. And in that, praise God. Praise him because you're saying this will happen. Just as he did as he stood before Goliath and said, you will die today, you uncircumcised Philistine. He was declaring in that moment, and it took place and became true. David had hope. He lived this out over and over again. He understood this hope that does not disappoint. He understood that God was a God of hope, and he trusted him completely. I believe that because David walked in hope continuously, that he trusted in God, that's why God says he was a man after my own heart. Was it Corey that said it before that trust is the love language of God? And David had complete trust. What husband in here doesn't know the love language of your bride? If you don't, brother, we got to talk. But you do. You know the love language of your loved one. You know what stirs them. You know how to show them complete love, how they're made, their personality. You know everything about them. So isn't it true for our Father in heaven? Shouldn't we know his love language? Shouldn't we also trust and have hope in him? The answer to that test question is yes. You know, when I read through the Psalms like 26 or Psalm 59, which I'm going to go into today, I read through those and I think, man, is this guy for real? Can he really speak to God this way? That takes some guts. I mean, he's declaring and he's shouting and he's saying, God, you will do this. 
You know, the answer is yes, you can. Because he was a man after God's own heart, he's giving us a way in how we are to pray. So pray like him. He had true understanding of what trust and hope really looked like. Even when he was walking in those tribulations, sometimes we think, oh, he's just crying out in depression and despair. But I really think that was just the heart of a child calling out to his father, saying, hey, listen to me. Daddy, help. When I look at Psalm 59, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but it starts with uh, David just crying out to God, deliver me from my enemies, O God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. That's that portion where he is, a, as a child, he is declaring out to God, or uh, crying out to God, saying, please, would you help me? But you know, you see the transi- transition and growth as David continues his prayer. If we go down to verse 8, but you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. I will wait for you, hope. O oh, you, you, his strength, for God is my defense. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemy. Hope is a declaration. Maybe you didn't know that before. Maybe you don't know how to hope for your future. You don't know how to have a relationship be rekindled or a situation that's really bad be restarted again. Declare. Hope is declaration. And declaration is trust. It's cyclical again. It's that Hebrew mindset. If you walk in that, then you're walking in hope, just as David did. You see, there's no distrust or despair here. He's declaring God's victory in his life, saying, this will happen because I trust you, God. It's a real thing. It's a fact. You see, he has the request, the declaration, and the praise. Verse 16, but I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning, for you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O my strength, I will praise, sing praises, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. This is one single prayer that he is crying out when nothing around him has even changed yet. What if we prayed like that every day? Maybe you do, then good. But imagine what would take place in your life if Turmoil is going on right here. You have tribulations going on in your life, but you're praying like David. You're you're crying out, you're declaring, and you're praising him. All in one moment, those three minutes that you're declaring out to the Lord, your face to the ground, you're saying, Lord, I need this done. But I praise you and I thank you because you've already done it. I trust you so much that I know you can do it. You will do it. You are my God. You're my defender. You're my savior. You see, David cried out, with such complete trust that he knew who God was and that God loved him. Why in our American Christian church do we just run to despair first without running to the one who is over that despair? Why are we continually going down this drain of turmoil and strife instead of standing up and saying, no enemy, no flesh, you cannot have that. I have a God who defends. I have a God who saves. I have a God that can take me out of this place and I believe and I know that I will be okay in the end because my future has hope because my future is Jesus and Jesus is my hope. Amen. David gives glory and thanksgiving no matter what takes place in his life. And I plead with you, no matter what you're going through, be as David and in that, have thanksgiving. The will-do attitude, even when it hasn't taken place yet. He is a man crying out with understanding and hope. And in my studies, and as the Lord has poured into me, I'm recognizing that. I can cry out, but it does nothing unless I cry out with hope. I can cry out, but it does nothing for my situation if I don't have trust. I can cry out, but it does nothing for me if I don't praise. There is a reason why I like to stand up front and raise my hands to heaven, because I am praising him for my future. I am praising him for my past. I am praising him for my now. 
because he is my God in the past, he is my God in the now, and he is my God in the future. And that will never change whatever circumstance comes around me. And I encourage you that it is in praise that you find the God of the Bible, the real, true God that stands up and and bends that brass bow and takes out our enemies, as it says in the Psalms. That is my God. That is your God. And it's our job to stand up and declare that, to believe in it, to recognize it. No matter how hard it is, no matter how much, how much pain you're going through in the loss of a loved one, know that your God loves you and he has a plan and purpose for your future, that he will hold you as his child and he will sing to you and be with you and cover you because he loves you. And the word says that he does. So if you're walking through that loss or you have the prodigal that has run away or you are sitting there not knowing what your future even looks like, Lord, I have, I have no hope for tomorrow. Wrong. You have hope. And that hope is in Christ. And he is speaking to you and he's breathing life into you and he is your firm foundation. Amen. It is my challenge today, and as we close, I'll have the worship team come back up. But it's my challenge to to study through the Psalms, to understand the Proverbs, to go through and change your prayer life to be just like that. You know, as I, Rachel and I have been going through things, not us personally, but my family, over this year, it causes torment within me. It's a spirit of torment that I just stew on something. I'm in my own mind. You know, she said to me, maybe this is what has really stirred on my own study where the Lord has been speaking to me. But as she said, pray like David. How did David pray? He was in torment. He had a spirit of torment come against him. How did he pray? Well, He recognized, he cried out, he declared, and he praised. That's that maturity that I said earlier that grows you up to make you bounce back that much faster. And it turns a a month or a season or a week or whatever you're going through in your torment to be a day, to be an hour, to be a thought, to be that bird that lands on your head that you, you swish away. If you but pray and have that relationship with your Lord to recognize what it means to have that hope, it changes your entire situation forever. That is what true maturity, as a true believer, as your Christian walk, that's what that looks like. And as I conclude, I want to actually even restate some of this because I want to hammer it home. I want you to remember the biblical definition of what certified, true, complete hope is because of Jesus. Remember that biblical hope is anchored in God's promise and characterized by trust and expectation. It is trust in his character. It is trust in his kingdom, the realm of the king's domain, which is everything. It is trust in him, that is hope. Even when hopes are deferred or delayed, that that verse, which I was going to put in here, but it's talking about how when you're in that place of you've given up, saying don't give up, don't defer your hope, but have joy by hoping. In your pain, in your loss, in your torment, have hope. Don't delay that hope anymore. Don't let it rob you of your joy. Don't let it rob you of your peace, but be encouraged by the faith and the hope and the perseverance of your tribulations. Mature and grow, knowing God's timing and His faithfulness are always perfect. Yes, He's given us a will, the free will, 
But when your will aligns with him to rule and reign in his kingdom, then you are set on that firm foundation of hope forever. Biblical hope is steadfast assurance and confident expectation in God's promises. Rooted in faith and trust in his character. It looks forward to the fulfillment of God's plan, bringing peace and joy even in the most uncertain challenges, the most difficult times. This hope is a fundamental aspect of any believer's life, providing strength and encouragement through all circumstances. So in that, stand and praise. Know that your God is with you in all things. I want to leave you with, with these four points. Just keep them in your, in your mind as a back burner. Number one, God's faithfulness and mercy. The Psalms constantly point to God's unfailing mercy and faithfulness as the foundation of hope. Number two, waiting on the Lord. Many of the Psalms express a patient waiting on God's intervention, showing that hope involves true trust and perseverance. Number three, God is a refuge and strength. Paul talks about this. Remember your helmet, the hope of salvation. Because of Jesus, God is our, as our rock, our shield, our refuge, providing a secure foundation and hope. Those are all words of scriptures about hope. Number four, rejoicing in hope. This is what I'm truly going to be calling you guys into if you would stand with me. Number four, rejoicing in hope. What I'm saying is praise. Praise God in hope. If you don't know how to hope, then praise God. If it doesn't make sense to you, then praise God. If you're in the valley, then praise God. If you're truly struggling, then praise God. If you're angry at him, then praise God. If you're in sorrow or a depression or in a loss, then praise God. If you're now alone, then praise God. Whatever you're going through, praise God. There is something that transforms inside of you. Something that takes place that I don't know what it is, but when you truly raise your hands and say, yes, Lord, I praise you, something happens within your heart. And that something is hope. Hope for your future. Hope because in your praise and your worship, you are trusting in God. So give him praise. Praise. 